Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. You know, we were talking about, uh, before we started this episode, we were talking about what we're going to talk about today. Because, you know, the recent episodes, there's just one crisis after the next. There's one huge thing after the next. There, There's Roe v. Wade. There's, uh, you know, I, I always... I always kind of go back and forth between sort of gallows humor and exasperation. There's a gun massacre in time for each new show. It's just nonstop. And, and, uh, you know, this week, you know, there, there, so far there's no new gun massacre, right? So we don't have that, but we want to, we're going to dig into, uh, we're going to dig into some of the aftermath of the Uvalde uh, mass shooting. And we, we we can't forget this other mass shooting that happened only about a week before up in Buffalo. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a post I've been working on that I, I th- these are all basically the same, even though there are aspects of them that are quite different. The, the shooting in Buffalo tied to this whole ecosystem of great replacement thinking, uh, racist gun massacres, you know, it's, 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 it's such a, it's such a, um, it's such a melange because, uh, you know, you dig into it. African Americans have been here for a long time. They're not, they're not immigrants coming from somewhere new. So all of those are, are are kind of just a broader mix of white supremacist violence. And they're sort of inflected in different ways. It's you hate black people, you hate the new immigrants, you hate the Jews who are supposedly bringing in the new, in, the new immigrants to dilute the power of the white Christians and all this kind of stuff. Um, but really, these are all these are all of a piece. Even though it would seem like the, you know, Uvalde shooting is, this is just a, 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 a deranged kid, I guess, man, 18 year old, uh, who decided to do this doesn't have a, you know, from what we can tell, there was no clear political agenda. He wasn't doing great replacement or whatever. Uh, he was actually, he's actually, I think, uh, Hispanic uh, in that part of the country. Uh, that by no means means immigrant. You know, the, much of the Hispanic population in that part of Texas predates the uh, Texas becoming part of the United States. But what you really have here is all of these are these mass terror events, the point of which is to sow terror. And that is about, you know, kind of one person's internal stuff, uh, their anger, their being a loser, them hating other, all the kind of, all those things, all that kind of toxic stew of crap that these deranged kind of people, almost always men, have. And the drive for total power and total violence that makes you something like a god for a short period of time. And as we know, in almost all these cases, the person is planning on dying in the event. Either they, they, they plan on killing themselves or, you know, kind of suicide by cop in the course of it. Uh, or they have certainly resigned themselves to that being highly likely that that's the case. So that's part of the dynamic. And the other part of the dynamic is that the victims are entirely random. And what I mean by that is, we, as, as I just said, some of these massacres, they're tar- targeting African Americans, they're tar- targeting Latinos, they're targeting Jews, targeting women in some cases. They are sometimes focused in terms of the group, but the assailant seldom ever knows any of the people. 
it's not like he has a beef with some, you know, with, with one group of people or something like that, or knows the person or something. Uh, and it's that very randomness that is at the heart of it and why it is so different from other kinds of, of gun violence. Now, one of the things that comes up each time we discuss this, each time we have one of these massacres, each time we go through the arguments about should, you know, should it be so easy to, to uh, go and purchase an AR-15, is some of the pro-gun crowd will say, okay, you know, you're, I know you're really emotional about this, but in fact, AR-15s are only responsible for a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the gun killings in the United States. Or the school mass shootings, yes, they're really sad, all that kind of stuff, but they're only a tiny, tiny fraction of the firearms deaths in this country. So really, you're just kind of emotional and don't really know the facts. And, you know, your AR-15 thing won't do anything because, again, almost none of the deaths are from AR-15s. And if you're so worried, what about all the people being killed in Chicago that are mostly killed with handguns and stuff like that? But that misses the point because the point of these killings, and it's why the shooters almost never know the victims, is because it is random. I, the shooter, am coming into this place where you are totally off guard. You do not expect a mass shooting to happen. You don't know who I am, so it's not like you know your friend down the road is pissed at you and you're a little worried. I am a random person out of nowhere, and I'm not even coming in to kill a particular person. I'm coming in, I've decided I'm going to die, and I'm going to kill as many people as possible. And that casts a pall over the whole society. You know, every parent in the country worries about this happening. And that's by design. You know, almost half of the people who, it, it's either half or maybe a little more than half or a little less than half, it is around that many. Almost half of the firearms deaths in the United States are, by, are suicides. Those deaths are obviously direct, <laughs> directly related to the victim. They are not coming out of nowhere. A, a, a very large number of additional deaths are people who know each other. Guy kills his wife. Much less often, wife kills the husband. People have a feud, whatever, right? Uh, gang murders were kind of like, I'm killing you because you did something, you came on my turf or something. We know there was a, there was a, a shooting on a subway car in New York City a week or so ago that was kind of just totally random. I don't know if it was a mugging gone wrong or something, but you know, totally out of the blue. The vast majority of murders are not, are not that way. It's not that the person, it's not that the victim is at fault, but it is growing out of things that are happening in their lives. Someone's angry at them. They did someone something else. There's a dispute, blah, 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 blah. It's the very randomness of these crimes that is the point that, and that is why we have, there is this, there is a cult of this in the United States the, you know, kind of going out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to kill as many people as possible. And I could come out of anywhere. And, you know, th there's, uh, that's why it's really incorrect when people, even some people who mean it, who say it as a good faith argument, say, well, you know, we shouldn't be so obsessed about AR-15s because, you know, this tiny, tiny percentage of people who die by firearm is, is AR-15s. There's a reason we treat actual terrorism differently from conventional crime. Because the point of it is to terrorize an entire population. And that is why, even though it gets muddled and people try to confuse things, that's why hate crimes, properly speaking, are treated differently by our laws. Because 
when someone murders 10 African Americans, you know, randomly, randomly in the sense of, you know, the assailant doesn't know the victims in a supermarket in Buffalo or in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, that casts a pall of terror over an entire community. The people who were actually murdered are obviously the primary victims, but they're not the only victims. And these are, these mass shootings are terror crimes. They are intended to be terror crimes. It's something really deep and sick in our society. Uh, And, you know, the fact that upwards of 50,000 people die a year in the United States by firearms is a huge issue, but it's not the same issue as these terror crimes that this country is uniquely in the thrall of. Because of the worship of firearms, because of the cult of total power that that exists around them, and because we're just kind of, uh, we're kind of messed up as a society. So I'm going to do another one of these things where I try to manage your transition from uh, a dark subject to the light subject of, of the wonder- wonderfulness of Grady's cold brew ice coffee. Sorry, Grady. I know this is always a bit of a transition, but I'll do my best here. It's hot, like too hot to put on real clothes and shoes to go out for iced coffee. But that doesn't mean you have to suffer without something delicious and cold to sip on. Get a Grady's cold brew bean bag kit delivered to your door and enjoy, enjoy smooth and silky iced coffee without ever leaving the house. Each kit makes 36 glasses of iced coffee, which means you'll be ready to weather even the worst heat waves. And with the price tag of just a buck a cup, you'll have money left over to splurge on a kiddie pool. Ready to feel the chill with every sip? Get 25% off at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. That's Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. Okay, uh, Kate Riga, what are you thinking on the on the gun front? It's funny because one of the things I've been thinking about most ties into your monologue neatly, which is in a lot of ways, the modern Republican Party and, you know, the gun lobby, gun interests, the overlap there in what they're trying to do really is a circle because, you know, ever since the past, you know, in 15 years ago or so was when there was this big decline in interest for recreational gun use and the gun companies were kind of scrambling and how to rebrand, you know, how, how to make their products catch on in a new way and that kind of heralded in the era of gun not just you know for fun but gun as critical self-protection and that was helped with the you know NRA backed in some cases NRA written stand your ground laws which all kind of contributed to this big tapestry of the world is a really dangerous place Um, often subtly it's a dangerous place because black people are dangerous and are violent and are, even if you're in the suburbs nearby and you kind of use all that to weave together this tapestry of your, you and your way of life are under siege. And the only way to defend that, the government's not going to protect you. You have to protect yourself. You have to be armed. And that has so overlapped with the Republican framing of American life you know ever you you think back to like Trump's American carnage speech it's the same thing it's this idea of kind of the good American subtextually you know the white heterosexual often male American is besieged by these threats you know whether it comes packaged in the form of critical race theory or mask mandates or whatever and it all builds up to this apocalyptic vision of America where of course it makes sense to be armed to the guild and that's all you can do and then these mass shootings perpetuated by this system is like a self-reinforcing loop because now we're in a world where children are getting murdered you know how could we live somewhere more violent or backwards than that 
and I don't know, it's just, it's such this kind of deep and profound connection and that they're both driving at the same thing. They're both trying to harness the really powerful forces of fear to, in the one case, sell guns and the other retain political power that, I don't know, in some ways it just, the right's complete embrace of such an extremist and nonsensical position on guns, you know, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there are points of the history here that, you know, anti-gun control politics in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s had a different kind of character. The, at least the sort of the idealized person it was on behalf of was, you know, ordinary working stiff who is really worried about all the crime in American society. And crime was historically high in that period of time. There was this kind of late 20th century crime wave, 70s, 80s, uh, into the 90s. And that he doesn't want the government to limit his ability to hold, you know, to have a a pistol in his shop, going to work, you know, the Bernie Getz case on the New York City subways, uh, which I believe was in the, I can't remember if it was in the, in the very late eighties or early nineties. That's all kind of a a piece uh, that it is. It's basically, I need to protect myself from conventional crime. And then, and this goes to what you were describing, it it shifts in the 90s and into the first decade of the 20th century, or 21st century, to the government or the race mobs, a different, you know, a whole in, deeply political mm-hmm. stuff. And so this isn't just like kind of, I need to be able to get off a few shots with my pistol to protect myself from the mugger, I need, I need like a compound, right? For when the, for when the, the, you know, the federals come to arrest me that I can fight them off kind of stuff. And one part, you know, I was just looking up again, the term, cause I want to make sure I had it right. This term modern sporting rifle, which was a, a, a marketing term to come up uh, devised by the gun lobby, which is basically AR-15s, the, these these rifles, semi-automatic rifles that at least look like for military use. There's a whole controversy, you know, gun, fo- gun people will say, yeah, it's really just a rifle. The fact that it looks kind of, you know, military scary looking is irrelevant. Well, okay, whatever. But that's the marketing term modern sporting rifle well you know it's 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 <laughs> but that has become you know that is a centerpiece now of of you know gun, gun sales in the united states and one part of it and i'm curious this is something i've i've seen discussed and one thing is is the decline of hunting in the united states many fewer people hunt now i have never been a hunter but i've been an angler, a fit, you know, someone who fishes my entire life. So, you know, to me, it's very different. I'm not sure it's that different in the, you know, it's not that different to the fish, right? Even though I do all catch and release, but so I can, I get it. I can, I can understand fishing. So I can, I can, I think I can at some level under, understand, uh, hunting, even though it seems different to me. Um, but once that, once that started to decline, what else do you sell guns for? Right? There's personal defense guns. There's just like, I like to go to the range and, you know, shoot off my, you know, Glock or whatever. Uh, but this more political, tactical kind of thing, like when the when the race mob comes to my house, am I going to be ready with my gun sight and my laser sight and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff? And then the other part of it, and I, I have always thought this is like greatly, greatly, greatly under, undervalued as a driver of all this, is that 
starting in 1990 and 1991, we have been in, in an almost constant state of war in the Middle East. So you have the Gulf War, the, the, the original war in 1991. Then you have uh, the long war in Afghanistan. You have the invasion of Iraq. And so a certain kind of military service, often in urban combat situations, so not just kind of like, you know, I, 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 I work on an aircraft carrier or like I'm in a tank, but I've got my helmet, my body armor, my M6, you know, my, my machine gun, that whole kind of, uh, you know, special operations ethic. And that's a huge amount of what this whole subculture is about. It's kind of, kind of like a cosplay thing. That, that, you know, that, that, that's me, I'm going to be that guy. And it gets, you know, some of it comes out of a certain kind of response to the LA riots, which I think is 91. I'm kind of losing. It's, you know, obviously I forget if it's, I think it was 1991. Um, all of these, uh, all of these things uh, come together to, 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 to get us here. But that's a, that's a big one the militarization of American society driven by the fact that we've been at war constantly and been at a certain kind of war, which is one that at least puts a lot of emphasis on urban combat. You know, one guy with a machine gun um, and body armor and all that kind of stuff and shootouts and stuff and, and, and the valorization of that. And, you know, there's always any society at war does a lot of valorizing of, of its soldiers and for, you know, not, not, not altogether for bad reasons. Right. I mean, kind of you're putting your, your, uh, it, at least if things are functioning, right, these people are in a war to defend the country at large and it's a very dangerous thing to do and all that kind of stuff, but it has this blowback effect. And all these things are, all these things are, you know, all these things fit together. Yeah, it's funny. Well, it's not funny, but the shooter um, in Texas, I think, had something like 56 magazines were found at the school. Um, and like 1,600 rounds, I yeah. think, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, my boyfriend's an, an Afghanistan vet, and he said when I read that to him, he, he was like, when I was in active combat, you know, in a war zone, I had seven magazines. I mean, it does, I think what you're saying is right. And I think it's connected to a lot of the other stuff we've been talking about, particularly this kind of crisis of American masculinity, which is being so used and abused by, you know, the Tucker, Tucker Carlson's of the world. I, this is so clearly the root, at least one of the roots of like the trans panic and this really virulent resurgence of kind of anti-LGBTQ sentiment in general from the right. But, it, you know, it, it's all grounded in the same thing of like gay teachers are not real men, they're groomers, they're sexual predators. And, you know, trans children are not people to be protected they're people to be you know at least pushed out of sight you know um at the very least and you need to keep your children from being poisoned in this way and from being turned into you know less than men and less than women but there's such there's just such a through line with that and then all these like old chubby guys, you know, dressing up like they're soldiers and pretending to be in militias and, you know, appointing themselves to go stand guard outside places, which is this really fundamentally childish desire to be the hero in the action movie, but without any interest in the other parts that come with being a soldier, which is discipline and hard work and extensive training, you know, with firearms and all the rest. And I just think all of these kind of. And you also have to show up each day. Right. Early in it's the morning. Not just like on, <laughs> yeah. just, not just on the weekends. Right. Exactly. And I just think all these things are really 
tied together and contribute to the sense of utility in the gun conversation. Like it really does feel like this is what America is. You know, the gun culture is embedded in the fabric of our society. Fighting it is pointless. Our institutions are in the grip of the vocal minority. So it doesn't matter what the rest of us do. And I have felt that lately as much as anyone else has. I think a lot of people have felt it since Sandy Hook in particular. You know, if a if a white six-year-old from Connecticut is not the victim that will move action, you know, who will? But a thing that I've been thinking a lot about in connection to that is the kind of war on big tobacco, you know, the the fight to get cigarettes to be a less ubiquitous part of American life. And I'm hoping to write something on it soon. But one thing that strikes me is how long it took to, you know, win that war, which I think you can say has been won. I mean, cigarette smoking rates are very low. There's a whole, you know, branch of other problems with like vapes and jewels and everything now. But it took so long. I mean, a What's and it's also po- I think it's important to say that politically, mm-hmm. no politician touch. I mean, there's some with vaping, like Grover Norquist right. is really into the, like the vape lobby. Yeah. But by and large, smoking is untouchable politically now. Right. It just no one says, "Oh no, no, smoker, no, no, no." It's it's like done. It's it's kind of like it it is it is you it is recognized as bad and. You know, on the margins, there's like, okay, do we do this thing because it's bad or that thing? But, but I guess, as someone who's more than a little older than you, it it did seem un, the smoking lobby did seem comically untouchable for decades. Yeah, and I think in a lot of major ways similar to guns, in that there is this big sense of glamour around them, um, you know, kind of ubiquity in in media and and in in physical life, you know. But what kind of stuns me about it is, so the big famous Surgeon General announcement, you know, pointing out the correlation between guns and lung cancer, that was in 1964. This had already been, that correlation had been well established in, you know, medical fields for like a decade before that. So even that is this really kind of delayed thing that has in the immediate uh, in the immediate aftermath, no effect, and perhaps even a contrary effect, because it made um, Congress people who were, you know, kind of being paid off by the tobacco lobby or had an interest in keeping them happy, made them be, you know, kind of resistant to this idea and push back even harder. And it wasn't until the 80s that smoking levels started dropping at really drastic levels. And I think, I think it's helpful when in the in the wake of a shooting where children were killed, which is just the hardest thing to take, and this feeling of complete and abject hopelessness, in a weird way, I mean, it's still totally depressing, but in a weird way, it almost does give me some measure of hope that it took a long time to root out cigarettes from our society, you know, and some critical pieces of affecting that shift I think could be replicated. A big one was the successful hijacking of the narrative away from this is about the personal freedom of smokers to this is about the freedom of people affected by the smokers. And that's, you know, that's a familiar argument when you put it in the gun context. And that's one that I think to this point, the pro-gun lobby has won, framing it as a you know, this is kind of an American v. American problem when really fundamentally it's a corporation versus American problem. And, you know, and the, just the other thing I was going to say about it is, and the hardest part to see a future in, is that the institutions are so kind of solidly on the side of the pro-gun lobby right now because you had the Supreme Court in Heller redefine the Second Amendment as, you know, a personal gun right and not a militia gun right. And that has set the groundwork for, you know, so much litigation and laws that have reframed this as, you know, Americans have the right to be individually armed, which is obviously not what anyone envisioned when they wrote that. It, it, it's funny that, you know, I went, it, it is especially, I mean, even for people my age and certainly for people younger, it's difficult to grasp just how ubiquitous smoking was mm-hmm. in American life 
in the 50s and 1960s and even into the 70s although it was declining then i mean i just i just looked it up to make sure i had this right um when when you know while kate was talking uh in the mid 50s 45% of the po- american population smoked and since men have always smoked at a higher well especially then more men smoked than women. It became a little more equal over time, blah, 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 blah. But that means that like the a big majority of men smoked, were regular smokers. And it's funny, one of the things I've always done this, but I've been on a bit of a, a kick over the last few months, uh, watching a lot of rock documentaries from uh, basically from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, a lot about the Rolling Stones, blah, 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 blah. And one of the things you see when you watch those is just, and I think people saw it when that, uh, you know, that that redone Beatles documentary came out, what was it, on Prime a few months ago, right, about the Let It Be recording of the album Let It Be. And people were sort of stunned, like, wow, they cannot stop smoking. <laughs> they cannot stop smoking. They're smoking constantly. And all of those, in all of those, now, you know, rock musicians, it's a little, little more out, you know, a, a little more usage of all sorts of things, but not much different. Basically, if you were a guy in the mid 20th century, you smoked. That's what you did, right? And so it is, it is, it's hard to capture how just how totally embedded it was in, in American culture. But, you know, it's funny. Again, when you come back to th- this point, and I think all the history suggests you're right that a real breakthrough was when people started talking about secondhand smoking. Mm-hmm. It's not just you. It's also your family. It's people around you. It's not, it, it, it's, the impact is not just on you. So it's not, it's not just up to you. Right. And so many of the things in our society today are driven by a, a different way of looking at externalities you know, the externalities of different actions. And, you know, one of the core things we always hear from the gun crowd is something that is, in a narrow sense, factually true. 99% of the people who are buying these guns are not shooting anybody. They're doing their background check. They're, you know, they're, they are totally law-abiding. And you're saying that they have to suffer because a few people go out and do gun massacres. Well, you know, as stated, from a certain perspective, there's there's a kind of logic there. You know, th- these people aren't harming anybody. What? Why? Why are you putting it on them? But a, <laughs> but there's this basic point: if you have four or five hundred million guns in the United States you're going to have more gun massacres. If you can, if when you were 18 years old, you can go in and even if someone can kind of eye you as being a bit of a freak and the kind of person who's going to like kill a bunch of kids, they've got to, they've got to sell you an AR-15, right? Unless you've, unless there's some history where you got like had a mandatory hold at the local mental hospital or, or, or threatened someone. And one of the things when I, when I kind of try to think about you know, the politics of this and how you argue these things when I am at least in a conversation with a notional, let's call it a notional, non-crazy gun rights person. And what I mean that, I, I, I'm not going to be talking about the person who says they need to, you know, have a compound and everything. I'm talking about the people who say how kind of like, hey, AR-15 is awesome. You know, there's a whole genre of articles about how the reason people love them is, is it's modular. You can, there's all these different attachments. So you can kind of, you know, it's like the Mr. Potato Head of guns, right? You can do all these different things and modify it. And that's super cool. And you get the best attachments and everything. And you go to the range and you're shooting stuff with it. And you're kind of feeling like you're, you know, you're there at the Bin Laden raid, you know, Uh, whatever it gives you kicks. I can see how that must be a lot of fun. Not my thing, but like, okay, yeah, shooting practice, you know, awesome. But to say to these people, like, okay, it's let's let's grant that it is awesome and it's fun and it's a great hobby and blah, 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 blah. But you're having this hobby 
creates the groundwork for these gun massacres. So really, it's on you guys. Can you come up with a framework where you can have that awesomeness and still we 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 take steps to at least limit these gun massacres as much as possible? And that could be at least a reasonable conversation because I think there are lots of things you could do to not prevent all of these massacres, but put real constraints on the ability to do for people to do them and still have that guy who wants to go to the range or go out, you know, somewhere in the country where it's safe to do so and do target practice and fire off his gun because it's awesome. But what is missing from this debate is the base, the, 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 the fulcrum of that conversation is missing, which is you're not killing anybody, but your good time makes this possible. So we've got to balance your good time with keeping everybody safe. And since you're the one who wants to have a good time shooting these guns, you need to, <laughs> maybe you need to step up and, and kind of get creative here and not with ridiculous things about how, you know, a school has to have a single point of entry and there has to be like, you know, 10 guys with machine guns there. That's not a reasonable thing. What's reasonable is like, at least you've got to be 21 to have one of these things. Maybe you need to at least take a quick class. I mean, you know, if it were me, I'd say you need to be registered or whatever, but there, there, there are a lot of things you could do and still basically have it where that, you know, kind of prototypical 30-year-old guy who's got two or three totally cool assault assault rifles and likes doing target practice can still have his fun because that's what he finds fun. Yeah. I mean, and not to bring this back to my current obsession, but like two of the measures that had very large effects on cigarette smoking were the cigarette tax, which was often then states would put their own taxes on top of it. And obviously, people are going to be more eager to quit if it is financially hurting them to maintain the hobby. And also the indoor smoking bans, because not only did that make smoking less prevalent, it changed the cultural perception of smoking. It made it like, oh, it's something that's gross. It's something that you don't want around you while you're eating or while you're on a plane. And that has a huge effect on something that for so long was a very, is a signifier of cool and of glamour. You know, that's a big part of it. And that is a real commonality I see with the gun thing, because also the realities of what gun, gun unfettered gun ownership causes is disgusting the same way that cigarettes are you know I mean there's a reason that when the Sandy Hook parents were um, at trial against Remington it was this huge fight about whether or not pictures of the children's bodies could be admitted in the trial and they were ultimately b banned they weren't allowed to be shown and I think so both of these things have this like glamorous facade disgusting realities and a huge dependence on both the idea that these things are so embedded in American culture that nothing is going to get rid of them and that, you know, fighting it is futile because it's always been around. It will always be around. And, you know, these two measures that were really effective against cigarette smoking were not comprehensive. You know, it wasn't like a, a successful government cigarette buyback program or something that America would be unable to pull off. I mean, we're unable to pull off anything right now, but there it seems like a more realistic potential reality that we could have a future of measures that significantly make it harder or more inconvenient or you know, just less easy to own a gun and how that that could have significant effects even if it's not comprehensive, even if it you know, doesn't get rid of mass shootings writ large, but could also help you know, by virtue of making gun ownership harder and more laborious could also make it less cool and less glamorous, which is like half the battle. Yeah. And I think another, another aspect of that less glamorous thing is, is that again, if I put myself in, in, in the, in that notional conversation with the non crazy gun mm -hmm. rights person, I think that person would say like, okay, your solution is to shame me, you know, to make me kind of outcast, to make me 
you know, gross and what I find fun gross. Um, you know, if it was up to me, like, yeah, because, you know, the consequences are for the rest of society are really great. But <clears throat> I think even within the even within that conversation, another thing you can do is create social incentives to say, if you use guns, you should do so in a way that is protective of the rest of society. So cool. You want to go to the range, you want to shoot your gun, blah, 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 blah. But you, uh, you know, maybe you're okay with having a license for a certain kind of gun. Even though you're not going to do anything wrong because you have some cognizance of the impact of this on the rest of society. Um, and there, there are, there are, there are ways that don't necessarily, you know, shame people who are into guns. And again, I don't have any problem with shaming people who are into guns, but the people who are into guns are not into shaming people who are into guns. <laughs> so maybe you compromise on, let's create a culture that shows that guns are dangerous and you might find them fun. And we want to let you have your fun, but we want you to send the signal that you recognize they're dangerous and you are going to act in certain ways that is cognizant of that. Um, because, I, you know, as I've written in a few posts, I think a huge amount of the gun issue, the, 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 the draw, what, 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 what draws people to these mass shootings is just the power of the gun. And I don't mean the velocity. I mean, it's political power in our country. It is unassailable. No one can touch guns politically. And so I think, you know, I think that's a big part of it. I think another another really important thing, which I don't expect is going to happen anytime soon, but I think, it, and, and it, it doesn't as directly impact, um, it doesn't as directly impact the mass shootings as just the everyday toddler finds the gun and blows mm -hmm. his head off kind of stuff is that we should create a legal framework where if your gun is improperly stored and it is stolen or taken and used in a crime, you are at least civilly liable for that crime. Maybe not criminally, but civilly. Uh, and if your, you know, if your gun is stolen and you don't immediately report the 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 um, the theft, you are liable. And that if you're going to have guns, you need to carry insurance in case you something happens and your gun is 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 used in a crime and you're liable for it. This would make people a lot more focused on how they store their guns. You know, there are safe, there are gun safes. There, there are ways that responsible gun owners do this. You have a gun safe. No one can get into it, basically. Or no one can get into it uh, in, you know, in practical terms. Toddler isn't going to get into it. Uh, no one can, can get into it, get it quickly enough to hurt you, hurt you or someone else. Uh, there's that. And also... A lot of people, you know, if you go to if you go to the insurance company and say, "Hey, I've got 190 guns. What's my how much is my policy going to cost?" Well, probably quite a lot, right? Not only because you have so many guns, but because they're kind of kind of they're going to kind of spot you as maybe a problem case. They don't want to carry the liability for that guy. And this is this is this is a case that Again, I don't expect this to happen anytime soon, but at least gets you to taking some cognizance of the externalities of your good time. And if you want to have a handgun in the house for for you know to protect your you know protect yourself, protect your family, uh, if you have a you know a gun safe. Probably getting a policy for that gun probably wouldn't be too much. You can have your gun. If you have a couple AR-15s and uh, maybe, uh, you know, you took a course, you know, two-day course, you can show you have a safe where they're kept, your policy probably be pretty manageable. But 
if you if you're not using them anymore, you might think twice about whether you want to have them because you have to carry the policy. So, and again, so this isn't a panacea by any stretch of the imagination, but I actually think it would have a pretty big effect because a lot of guns are just floating around and kind of like you just give one to a friend. Well, under this system, you give one to that friend, you're on the line for what happens to that gun. And that's a real bad feeling because that gun's going to be around for a long time and you don't know who's doing what with it. I think it would have a pretty big impact and it would also get us into the framework of everybody's responsible for the externalities. We're not in this radical individualist world where the fact that this kid was able to seemingly walk into a gun shop on his 18th birthday and and buy an AR15 and presumably, you know, hundreds of rounds to to shoot with it. That's on everybody, and it, it's 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 on everybody, but it's especially on the people who who make it impossible to to do any reasonable regulation of firearms. Right. Yes, yeah, so we wanted to touch briefly on what is happening in Congress on guns, which is you know, namely nothing. Um, Schumer scheduled two background check bills for a vote. Unclear if they will even end up holding that vote. We've gotten into this like gruesome pattern after mass shootings that are in some way distinctive enough to still rate attention, which is there's a pretense at this bipartisan effort to pass, you know, even from its inception, mitigating around the margins type of gun control. Um, And you've got your quote unquote, you know, as Biden called them, rational Republicans kind of powwowing with Democrats, and then the efforts fall apart because there will never be 10 Republicans to vote on any kind of gun control legislation, and the filibuster is in place. Um, And it's funny because I tweeted last week the response, right, this was like a day or two after the shooting, um, responses from Mark Kelly and Kirsten Sinema, and Sinema kind of gave this the American people want us to act blah 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 um and it's funny because she doesn't ever really give hallway interviews so I was kind of uh you know shocked to see this clip roll in in the first place but anyway um and then a reporter asks her okay so does that mean that you will vote for you know filibuster reform or a carve out to pass gun control legislation and she says you know I don't think DC solutions are realistic here, which is like, I don't know, a textual read all into itself. Um, And then you had Mark Kelly, who obviously is married to Gabby Giffords, who was the subject of an attempted assassination, got shot in the head, miraculously survived and has become a gun control advocate now. And he said, you know, it's fucking nuts to do nothing about this. And so I tweeted out their responses side by side. And Cinema's office was so mad at me. Like, <laughs> I was. And so, in, what? What? How was that expressed? Um. Yeah. They. Well, they were saying this tweet is misleading. It lacks context. You should take it down or clarify it. You know, I had to do kind of multiple rounds with them. Because, did they read? How did they? Re, they reached out to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so they're. And it was about the tweet. Yes. My okay. tweet, which just had the part of her quote. That was about filibuster reform because after she says DC solutions are not realistic here, she's like, you know, I think we need to have conversation. This is not verbatim, but it's something like, yeah, you know, there's some commonality on red flag laws. I think we'll have these conversations and actually, you know, do something the American people want. And they were mad that I didn't include that part of her tweet. And, you know, I responded and was like, well, to be honest, that part of the quote is a lot less newsworthy than her stance on reforming the bill that would let any of these things pass. And I was just so boggled because her staff. And what did they say? What did they, and what did they say? They said, you're making it sound like Kirsten doesn't want to do anything about gun violence. And it's like, well, she doesn't, (laughs) you know, or at the very least she wants to do something about it less than she wants to retain the filibuster, which is comes Mm -hmm. out to the same thing. But it was just, kind of a boggling exchange for me because it 
this weird kind of attempt to spin your way out of culpability here, like internal spin too, not just public, but internal spin. Like, no, I really, really want to do something about guns, but I'm not willing to do the thing that would make any of these bills pass is that is kind of, that's a crazy thing to internalize and to make yourself believe on some level. Well, I I would, you know, there often are things where, you know, you have to balance things, but even there you get to the fact that you are saying they're balanceable things is itself a statement. Right. And it, and it sounds, and, and, and PR people, communications people often do this. It sounds like they were doing the thing where they were trying to slip in there that you're kind of, are you, you know, here Kirsten's caring so much and you're making it like she doesn't care about those kids. Are you really saying that about Kirsten? Do you feel comfortable? You're saying <laughs> that right. she's the victim of your, exactly. of your, of your defamation like, or yeah, something like that. I agree. That. It's a tough day to support the filibuster, you know, but that's not the position I staked out. So. Right. Right. Um, right. Inter- how did, how did that, how did that exchange end up? And they just stopped responding to me after I was kind of like, you know, I contextualized it fairly. I made it clear that her, you know, and I made it clear in the tweet that that remark was about filibuster reform, not about the kind of theoretical landscape of passing gun legislation. So, right, I don't right. know. It's so just, basically, they went a couple rounds and they yeah, just kind of gave up. Yeah, once. yeah. I, yeah, I think yeah. I was just taken aback by it, the level of like internalization because you expect on some level that a position as cynical as one of I want to do gun reform, but I support the filibuster that you got to know when you're at the center of that position, how bullshit it is and how you're covering your own ass because you don't like feeling like you're part of the problem. That's not an obvious thing, you know? So surprising that, that even the comms person would be able to kind of present it like, Hey, you're exactly. We're we're, we're 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 doing this is legit here, and you're just right making right. it like we are not legit. If it had come in a package of like more, this is bad optics. You know, you're this looks bad. Agreed, totally agreed. <laughs> but you know, or sometimes what a what a what a what a cannier and and a good communications person, what makes them good usually is they will suit the argument to the to the audience, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so sometimes in a case like that, they will, they will come at someone and they're not trying to make you feel kind of you're being unfair or think about Kirsten's feelings or something like that. They'll find something that is maybe technically inaccurate Mm. and, and kind of drill in on that. And, and, and any good reporter will, even if they think the overall point is bullshit, if, if you can say, okay, fine, you think I'm full of shit. I don't like you, you don't like me, but I'm here to tell you that here you're this is not technically accurate. And that's that is that's the way to come at someone in mm-hmm. that context if it you know, but it sounds like they didn't <laughs> it sounds like they didn't come at you with the right argument. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so in our last few minutes we wanted to discuss something different but connected in that especially recently, it's kind of felt like Biden has had to reel from one external crisis to the next. You know, we've really ever since, I think, Russia invaded Ukraine, it's been this series of, I don't want to say unpredictable because mass shootings are very predictable in America, but things that were not on his plan, you know, things that were not part of the the April-May comms plan of here's what we're going to talk about and here's what we're going to focus on like that has not been possible for a while and one piece of that right now is inflation the still you know continuing to be high inflation rates and people's concern about that and inflation as like the go-to tool to make a bad faith argument because it's so in some ways, like fungible and speculative. And, you know, it's, it's a fact thing, but it's kind of based on... You can say anything's exactly, behind it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or any mix of things are behind it. And on top of all that, I think as we've probably discussed before, the president just has like very, very limited 
power over inflation or very limited tools to use against it. But as we've seen, this week has kind of become inflation week from the White House. Biden wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. You know, Janet Yellen has been making the rounds. Jerome Powell, it's just kind of this you can see the the communication strategy of this week we are talking about inflation and how we're going to make it better and also doing what has been what has proven to be a difficult balancing act of on the one hand you know joblessness has plummeted since Biden took over and in some ways the economy is doing really well while also kind of being sympathetic to people who are trying to deal with items that are priced a lot higher than they usually are um, but one thing that I was really struck by in the Wall Street Journal piece that Biden did is that so much of the stuff in there is kind of negligibly connected to inflation or may have an inflationary impact if X, Y, and Z. You know, one thing he talked about a lot was deficit reduction, which you know, economists of all stripes say could have an inflationary impact based on what else is going on in the economy. But you could have deficit reducers that are inflationary and that are not inflationary. I mean, there's just there's way too many factors there. And I saw it and I almost wondered, like, is that some kind of weird Joe Biden or Joe Manchin olive branch thing? Because Manchin has like convinced himself that debt reduction and inflation are intrinsically linked. But you had that and then you had the other thing that he was talking about in how to achieve the debt reduction was basically a reiteration of a plan they've talked about before, which is like going after rich people who are evading taxes and using overseas, you know, tax shelters and stuff like that, which again, economists are kind of head scratchy about. They're like, that might help on the margins, but it, you know, it's not the first line of defense you would do against inflation, but it did. Anyway, all that to say that it did strike me in this just really weird position Biden's in where he's trying to look like here's the stuff we're doing to take it under control when can't do that much to get it under control. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing with inflation is that we know, we know how you deal with inflation. That is you tighten the money supply and in all likelihood cause some sort of economic contraction Mm -hmm. and that settles it out. The problem is that is not immediate and that causes a huge amount of economic pain. Um, and there's a, there's a sort of, um, you know, there, there's a secondary debate among economists that we are, you know, when, when you're at eight percent, you're not in the realm of that debate. But there's a separate debate at a lower level that inflation hawks basically say, you know, inflation should be under two percent. And a lot of more progressive economists say it doesn't need to be under two percent, like four percent is fine as long as it's stable. Um, you know, if it's stable at five, four percent, that can even have a that um, that can have various positive effects. Um, y- you can also there are also things that if you're if you're if you're totally focused on inflation has to be under two percent. There's a lot of good things you can't do. You can't. It's hard to have full employment. Blah 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 blah. I think there's pretty much universal agreement that eight percent is is. Out, is outside the, the the realm of that debate, you know, a, a a really tough thing. And this is just one of those things of like, you signed up for the job that I, I think there are, there are significant, um, there's significant evidence that the things that were driving inflation ha- were driving inflation have crested to a significant extent. And actually the inflation number that came out uh, sometime last week actually showed it starting to come down. The problem is, is that you have, you, you have everything tied to the war in Ukraine, which is a, that you have Europe trying to cut off its use of Russian oil, which has obviously created a huge demand issue where they've got to come up with that oil from somewhere. That's going to keep energy prices high. Then you have the fact that that Russia is keeping almost all of Ukraine's grain supply bottled up. And aside from inflation, that's going to create maybe not famine conditions, but real food shortages in lots of parts of the world. And just in the nature of things, you're reducing supply. That's going to drive up the cost of food, you know, mainly grain, but that, you know, kind of lots of things include grain. So you have these, you have these things tied to, um, tied to the war in Ukraine that are just going to be 
big drivers of inflation by choking off supply. And and you could go in and say, okay, Vladimir, like, okay, we can't deal with this inflation. Just, just do what you want and let us have the grain and let us and we'll buy, buy the oil. Obviously, that's not where the country, that's not where the world is, and I don't think that's where the world should be. Um, but those are just examples of things like that was not predicted. It was not predictable. And there's not enough grain available. And that's textbook inflation. You've got you've got demand, you know, kind of equal demand in the face of declining supply. That gives you inflation. You know, um, sometimes life isn't fair. Yeah. There you are. It, it does just, I don't know, it strikes you that so much of like successful versus unsuccessful presidencies have been so heavily determined by what happens during their presidency, even more than what the president himself does. I don't know. It just, it feels like, you know, there's all these kind of think pieces about how Biden is too reactionary and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, (laughs) what do you want him to do? You know, it just... It feels yeah, like I mean, of late there have just been these big external crises that have kind of dominated his agenda and everyone's attention, and that just happens yeah. sometimes. I think I think that's a big part of it. You just had these things happening that were, you know, out of his control, unpredicted, and then you just have to deal with them. I think that is basically right, right? He's just he's just drawn a a, a, a pretty bad hand. Uh, you know, that's just, that's just the reality. Having said that though, there are also many, many cases in history, even relatively recent history where bad things can cause a rally around the president. Mm -hmm. You know, often a foreign war, uh, gets people, you know, there's, there's, it, this is sort of a unique case. We're not at war with Russia. Right. It's very indirect. We're not, but we're not, um, you don't have our army involved, thank God. Um, so it's a little different, but, but, but those can, uh, often you do have like, oh, our president's out there. He's, you know, kind of calling the shots in the world stage and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> you can, um, after the Oklahoma City bombing in, I believe it was 19. 19- April 1995. Um, I don't, th- yeah, pretty sure it was April 1995. Uh, that, you know, we've, we've, we've become so used to it now. It's become almost a cliche, but it was actually a, a kind of new, unique thing that Clinton went to Oklahoma City and like, you know, hugged the victims and all that kind of stuff. And some of that was that, you know, we didn't have a lot of horrific domestic terror incidents up to that point. Mm -hmm. But it was also part of the new media age and, you know, kind of nonstop TV and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I'm not saying that, that, that Clinton, you, but that was one thing that allowed him to sort of shift the dynamic after the 1994 midterm elections. And part of that was that even though neither side quite wanted to say it, it was sort of like these like militia Republican dudes are pretty fucking crazy. You know, it's not all fun and games, right? This is, we're, this is, you know, we're, 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 we're cooking with gas here. So that was one part of it. In any case, not every bad thing that happens on a president's watch hurts the president politically. Uh, some is, some, you know, there, there's no, there's never been a case where like, th- there's a lot of inflation. People are like, man, glad, you know. <laughs> Boo yeah to the president because he's fighting the inflation fight. Not everything, but some things. And so I do think there is um, there is an aspect of this that they are kind of reactive. Um, but at the same time, it's hard to at a certain point it gets hard to distinguish that from if you got ten things to react to, you're gonna be kind of reactive. Yeah. Right. It's it's you know, I think it's it's possible that that after the fact that we'll have a little more insight into 
these different dynamics, but I think there's kind of both. And, and, you know, it's funny. I'll, one, one thing I, and I noticed this yesterday and it really kind of caught my eye and I think it is not uh, unique around the United States. There's new poll in Michigan and Joe Biden's down at 36%. So he's like, that's like abysmal, mm-hmm. right? Especially for a somewhat blue state, right? I mean, when, when president has like, you know, nationally at 40%, he's still probably doing pretty well in New York and Massachusetts, but he's, you know, it's getting dragged down by Mississippi and Texas. This is Michigan, right? At the same time, Gretchen Whitmer, so so Biden was at 36% approval and 55% disapproval, 55, really bad. Gretchen Whitmer was 49% approval, wow. and 41% disapproval. It's like they're operating in different political planets. Now, this is pretty good for Gretchen Whitmer, and it's pretty good for the Democrats in general, since she's the one up for re-election this year. But it shows you that, and there are a lot of signs of, you know, look, I'm still, I'm still, I think, you know, cautiously pessimistic about the midterm elections. But there are also signs out there that, you know, president's unpopular, they're going to get blown away in the midterms. And yet you look at some of the nitty gritty details and the numbers don't quite show that. So there's something out there that, um, you know, one view might be, well, maybe Biden's just a bad president. You know, uh, people aren't so much against Democrats, but Biden just sucks and they, they think he's doing a terrible job. Or it could be that he has become the receptacle for the fact that everybody just kind of feels bad yeah. about everything that's happened in the last couple of years and everything kind of sucks, mm-hmm. right? We had this, 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 uh, this, you know, terrible pandemic, which is, you know, we're kind of getting into the, into the rear view mirror now, but it's not done, but it's, you know, it's, it's moving towards being more in the rear view mirror than in, in, you know, looking forward. And we thought kind of, we're all ready to get back to things being awesome. And now there's like, Gas is really, price is really high and, you know, everybody's just cranky and upset and maybe Biden's just a receptacle of that. And and who knows which it is? Maybe it's kind of both. But I do think that all of these things are not lining up like we would normally expect them to line up. And I think that is because we are still in this phase, you know, those little uh, Christmas snow things you shake around, those little novelties that you snow step Those are called snow globe. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's why you're the co-host. <laughs> uh, those snow globe things. You know, we are kind of like our world is a snow globe. And, and starting two years ago, someone just took it and shook the shit out of it, right? And we're still kind of there. And everybody's just <laughs> thinks that sucks. And, uh, and that means that like all the sort of indicators don't quite line up. You know, everybody says the economy is terrible, but there are like more jobs than are there people to have them. And, and, and unemployment is like a three or lower than 3%. We're like, we're truly at like full employment. And like, if you don't like your job, quit and you'll have another one in a week. Right. I mean, and yet everybody thinks the economy is terrible. And, and, and I think we all kind of understand at some level that both are true. Yeah. So, you know, everything is still, we're still in that snow globe thing. TM, <laughs> snow globe. All right. All right. So I think that, I think we have, we have, we have given the illustrious uh, listeners of the Josh Marshall podcast <laughs> an hour plus of quality content. Uh, let me remind everybody that uh, the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. You can get 25% off at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. And I think that's it. All right. See you next week. Later. The Josh Marshall podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter Kate Riga, and TPM founder, editor-in-chief Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to Why Not Jansfeld for our podcast theme song. And thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen.